everyone. Hello. Hello. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Dimitri Strijinas. I'm a faculty member at the Department of Computer Science here at the University of Nicosia. And I'm a senior member at the university's AI lab, uh, where I specialize in big data management and data intensive computing. Uh, this also makes me very active in the new data science uh, programs, which were essentially launching in the fall. And we will introduce them during the end of our webinar. Uh, so enough about me. I'm actually very glad that you could actually join us. And even if we cannot meet in person, at least through YouTube, uh, we are being joined by people across the world. So today we're gonna talk about data science, uh, but we're not just gonna do this by introducing uh, concepts in a very formal, let's say, manner. And some people may even say in a boring way. Uh, instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna do this through a very interesting project. We're gonna talk about music and the songs that we like. And this project was actually designed by two of our students. So uh, who we are. So today I'm, I'm actually very proud to have with me Ram Rosenberg, uh, who's a third year student at the department, at our department. And we also have Pandelis Grigoriadis, who is actually, who actually has a bachelor degree from the UK, but as a research intern here at the AI lab, uh, he wanted to extend his knowledge in data science. And so he basically enrolled in my course, which is entitled Introduction to Data Science. Both are aspiring data scientists, and of course they have a very, very bright uh, future. So we already talked about uh, who we are, and I will shortly leave the floor to Ram and Bandelis, who will present their project. And once they're finished, we'll talk about data science here at uni and future career prospects. So essentially right now, I'm virtually passing to Ram the microphone. All right, thank you. So this started out as a semester project for an introductory data science course. And with any um, data science project, we start with a hypothesis or a question about the real world, something that we wanna know, something we wanna get the answer to so we get knowledge and we can create wisdom from that. So we start off by getting our raw data and we make it a little bit smaller and a little more usable and that gets us to information. Then we look at our information and start to extract knowledge. We try to understand our knowledge and that gives us understanding and hopefully we'll get wisdom that we can use in the future to make better choices in anything. So computers are really good at processing big amounts of data, but they're not as good as humans as at um, telling you why the data is important or why it's interesting. So data is useless unless we can convert it into a structured form. Data is everywhere. It's in videos and sound clips, everything like that. So that's a good example of unstructured data something that we can't just represent in a table. So what we want to do with that unstructured data is make it structured data that we can't represent in a table so that then we can play with it and work with it so that it works for us and we can extract some knowledge and hopefully wisdom. So let's quickly go over the data science process. We start by asking a question about our world. So a hypothesis, like I mentioned before, then we hope to collect data from the world, and then we move on to the data pre-processing phase. So this is composed of two parts, the data cleaning, where we go through our data and we make sure that everything looks normal, that there's not strange things in there that are gonna throw off our predictions. So we fill in missing values, and just make sure the data is all nice and clean. So after that, we do some data transformation. So we make sure that all the data fits together and that it's in a nice shape so that we can use it. After that, we do some exploratory data analysis that helps us get a better idea of what our data looks like. Generally, what are the main characteristics? And then we move on to making models and designing algorithms. 
So under that umbrella, we have data mining, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So once we've made a model and used some algorithms to find out what's going on, we move on to the visualization. So that's the fun part where you make graphs and uh, generally nice visuals that are interesting for everyone to look at and where the information is very obvious. It's a good way to communicate results. So after that, we hope that we have wisdom, something that we can apply to the future. So just a little bit of background for our project. Music is part of the human experience. So no matter where you are in the world, who you are, your gender, your religious background, everybody's exposed to music on a daily basis. And it has become even more accessible in modern times because we have things like smartphones and the internet that literally there's millions and millions of songs at your fingertips. So something we're gonna look at is Spotify, one of those tools that uh, really brings music to you. So before we get into our hypothesis, it's important to mention that songs can be described in terms of their features. So when I say a feature, I mean like the genre, how many beats per minute are in the song, can you dance to it, things like that. So our hypothesis was, are there certain features that drive popularity? Does more of one feature guarantee popularity in the song? Is there something people don't like? What do they like? That was our hypothesis. So the quest for knowledge starts with big data. And what does that mean? That means that just one song doesn't really tell us anything. It tells us just about that song. But how about if we have a few million songs? That can get you something much more interesting, which is you can start to see trends. And when you can see trends, you can make predictions and apply it to the real world. So we worked with more than 8 million songs. So I guess you understand that's a lot of data, big data. Uh, here's where we took our first set of data from. It's the Spotify charts. You pick a date and a region. Here you can see we've selected Cyprus, and then you pick a time frame. So this is weekly. And you can see that Rockstar was the top song for this week in Cyprus. Then you can see at the top right here that there's an option to download a CSV file. And I'll show you what the CSV file looks like. So here you can see our CSV file. This is a nice example of structured data. Like I mentioned before, you can see everything is orderly and clear. There's nothing missing. We have position, track name, artist, streams, and URL. So we had to do that for all the years from 2017 to 2019, all the days. And so that's why you see there's several number ones. And then on the right, you can see the different regions that we got the information from. At the bottom, you can see that there were actually more than 8 million rows. So that's a lot of data, big data. So for the next part, we did a little bit more data collection and we needed to get the song details. So those were the features I talked to you about before. So like genre, popularity, things like that. How we got them is we went to Spotify's API, which is, stands for Application Programming Interface. And that's basically the way that we speak with Spotify's database to get all their information so that we can use it. So here's the resultant data set that we got. You can see we have title, artist, genre, year, beats per minute, energy, danceability, decibels, liveliness, balance, duration, acoustics, acousticness, speechiness, and popularity. So those are all the features that are shown in this data set. Not all the features were useful to us, so we got rid of them. This is called dimensionality reduction. The features that we decided to get rid of were decibels, so how loud the song is, liveliness, which was the likeliness that a recording of a song was filmed or recorded live, 
duration because all songs or most at least are between two and five minutes and acousticness. So how about the features that we did keep? We kept genre. So those are things like, is it R&B? Is it pop, dance pop, things like that. Beats per minute, which is roughly how, how fast the song is. Danceability, which is a scale from zero to one, um, showing how suitable the song is for dancing. And they base this on rhythm, tempo, beat strength, and overall regularity of the song. The next thing we kept was valence, which is also measured from zero to one. And that's a general measurement of the overall um, positivity in the song. So a song with a value closer to zero would be sound more angry, sad, depressed, while a song with a value closer to one would sound more happy, joyful, and cheerful. Then speechiness, which is again measured between zero and one. A value of 0 0.66 would represent a song with a lot of words in it, and obviously above 0 0.66, so think like Eminem, a lot of words in his songs. And then a value bef um, beneath 0 0.33 is a song that's purely melodic. There are no words in it. And then obviously in between that range from 0 0.33 to 0 0.66, we have songs that are the most common with some words and some melody. <clears throat> Energy is a perceptual measure of intensity. So generally a song that sounds energetic or has a high energy score feels fast, loud, and noisy. And then obviously we had to keep popularity because that's what our whole um, hypothesis is based off of. What drives popularity? So we wanted to pick a few countries to see if people listen to the same things everywhere or if there's differences in taste depending on geographic location. So we tried to pick a wide range that are somewhat diverse. So we looked at South Africa, the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, Brazil, and Indonesia. So we have a lot of neat data. And now, now what do we do with it? So just looking at it in its tabular form isn't very interesting. And it's also very difficult to extract insights. When you look at the table, yeah, there's a lot of data, but it doesn't really tell you anything. So now it's time to make the data useful so that we can gain knowledge and hopefully some wisdom. Here we move on to, into the data pre-processing phase. So on the left, you can see the first data set I showed you with the popular songs in each region. And then in the, on the right side, you can see the data set with all the song details. So title, artist, genre, year, the things that we've gone through. So here we can see how we combine the two data sets. We use title and artist to index and to identify the same song in both data sets. So now we have one big data set with a lot of data in it, but um, everything isn't perfect yet. So I'm gonna pass you over to Pendelis and he's gonna tell you about the next step of the data science process. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Hello guys, my name is Pendelis and thank you very much for joining our live session. As you can understand, 8 billion songs is too much data for us to analyze on our own and get to those insights we want. So our job as data scientists is to use computer and by giving them the right instructions and use their tools, they can assist us. Progressing in the project, our next step is the data cleaning phase. And having a big data set, such the one my colleague Ram shown before, involves cleaning. So the next step we followed in the process is to clean this massive data set. And by cleaning, I'm referring to the selection of the data we need and only that. This consists of the removal of all empty and complete data values, the deletion of duplicate values, and the selection of the songs that were streamed in the countries and continents we have selected. So by doing this, we are left with such a small, less data. As you can see, a smaller data set which hides the answer to our hypothesis. The next phase is the exploratory data analysis phase, and 
This is a stage we are trying to collect insights, information, in, and in other words, observe what data can tell us. In order for us to do that, we had to do some statistical analysis and lots of plot plotting. By statistical analysis, I'm referring to the collection of the descriptive characteristics of our samples. For example, as you can see from these figures, are summarizing the main characteristics of our data sets. The bottom left are summarizing, is summarizing the characteristics of all songs, while the other one is summarizing the descriptive characteristics of songs by continent. But still, this is too difficult for us to understand what these numbers can tell us to identify pattern. So we need to visualize it. We need to make it visual. And we use plots. So we're coming to the visualization phase and visualization help us understand better information and derive insights. For example, looking at this figure, we can see five different histograms, one for each of our features. On the y-axis, we can see on the y-axis there is the number of songs, while on the x-axis is the features of value scales. And by looking at the mode, of each one, which is the most likely value on our data set for each feature, we should be able to detect which features values are common in a popular song. For example, by looking at the first histogram of the bits per minute feature, we can immediately identify that approximately 20,000 songs have feature value of 100. This 65 stands for danceability. 51 stands for balance and five and five for speechness. In other words, people prefer a song with a moderate tempo that it's moderately good for dancing, is not happy or sad, and has some words and some music. In addition, as you can see on the last histogram, the popularity feature, the most likely value is between 80 and 90, and this is because our data set is focusing on just the top songs, on just the most popular songs, like Ram mentioned before. Plotting helps us recognize correlation between features as well. And more precisely, correlation means which features are related with each other. On the right hand, on the right hand side, we can see the correlation matrix of all features we have selected. And we can immediately identify a relationship between balance, danceability, and energy with values more than 0.40. Then we can visualize them like, like we did on the left-hand side, and we can immediately say the fact that as energy and balance increases, the more danceable the song is likely to be. Considering the germ of each song, of each song, we produce plots that show the general popularity and distribution of top songs, like this figure here. We can see that while some germs are consistent with their popularity, such as, such as pops and pop variation, others are gaining a fan base or fading away. And this is suggesting that while larger trends have stayed in power, smaller ones are more likely to come and go. And according to this, we can clearly state the fact that the Canadian contemporary R&B is not listed in the 2019's top song journal, while it was moderately popular in 2017. Further, in considering countries, we produce the same general popularity and distribution plots for each one of them, like this one, which considers the United Kingdom. Looking at the plot, we can see that Canadian contemporary R&B and EDM jazz are starting to lose their popularity, and Brostep has overtaken the popularity in the 2019. The same stands from Brazil as Canadian pop and EDM or down tempo lost all their popularity, and Brostep and pop has overtaken the popularity figures in 2019. Furthering. By observing all of these plots, we are able to identify that Brostep and pop variations were all the top germs in 2019 for all of our continents. And we can clearly state that 
no matter the geographical location and cultural differences, everybody seems to prefer songs in the same way. Visualization also helps us to observe outliers, and by outliers, I mean data values that are far from the average values, far from the other data points. This 3D this 3D scatter plot visualizes the top songs based on their popularity, on valence, and BPM features. The selection of these features was based on their standard deviation values. More precisely, these songs' properties values appear to vary in a wider range rather than other ones, and this allows us to assume that popularity-driven insights could be obtained from this feature's value, as other ones appear in more stable context. In this figure, every data point is a song, and the closer two songs points are, the more similar the songs are. In our case, we can identify the Ed Sheeran shape of, shapes of you as an outlier, because we can identify a big gap between these data points, and we call that a cluster. So, in all similar songs, the Ed Sheeran shape of you dot is further away from the other popular songs. And this is why his songs, like The Shape of You, differentiate a lot in terms of feature value from all of the other popular songs. And that indicates that the artist writes and produces songs in a different way from the other artists and still is popular. Just to give you another example about outliers, think about football. In football world, Cristiano Ronaldo and Messi are outliers because their stats are far from higher from the other from the other play players. And this is why we identify them as outliers. And in our case, outliers indicates who are the top artists in terms of popularity and balance and BPM feature values. So depending on the case, and in most cases, not considering outliers can cause serious problem and hide those insights I told you before. Coming to the last step of our process, we are now able to extract wisdom. And by, com by completing all the previous stages that we are mentioned before, we are able to conclude to that. Everybody seems to enjoy a wide range of speeds and moods, meaning that they don't prefer any specific speed tempo, neither just happy or just sad songs. Also, pop and pop variations were always popular globally. The one thing we didn't expect and we were so surprised is the shocking popularity increase of Prostep, which was one of the most popular genres in 2019. Just to give you another insight, Prostep derived from Dubstep. So dust, Dubstep started losing its popularity in the previous two to three, four years, and Prostep overtook his, its place. And, and Prostep artist is Grillex. Furthering, people seem to prefer balanced songs, as I mentioned before. A song with a moderate tempo and one that is neither happy or sad is moderately danceable and contains both music and a gentle proportion of words. This is, according to this, people seem to prefer songs with a moderate number of words, and this is because the speechness feature was the most stable one, was has it had the, the lowest variety, the very the lowest. So in order for us to be able to complete this data science project and go through all this process, we use some data science tools. One of these is Anaconda's Jupyter, which is an open source web application that you can use to create, run, and share documents. You can also run code, run live code, do some equations, visualize stuff, and manipulate some text. The data programming that we were using was Python which is a programming language widely used and is flexible, open source, and is favored for data analysis. This is because of its massive libraries. For example, NumPy library helped us to summarize all the descriptive statistics of our, of our data sets and do all the statistical analysis, while Pandas library helped us to clean, transform, and manipulate our data frame while all the other ones helped us to visualize stuff and get to those insights we were mentioned before. 
And by concluding, I want to say that data is the most valuable source we are currently have. And by giving value and right manipulating it, we can convert it into the most valuable asset. This is all for me. Thank you guys. Our professor and supervisor, Mr. Trijinas, is going to further this session. Okay, thank you, Bandelis and Ram, for the presentation and all your hard work uh, that you have done. Now, uh, data science is driven by application. And other than the project that you have just seen, the data science, pro the data science process that Ram has already introduced uh, can be applied to a broad range of applications and some are the following. So uh, first of all, uh, let's talk about uh, pattern detection, which is where a prominent example of this are growth trends, where uh, back in 2013, here's a, a very nice example and very relevant uh, to our times. Uh, Google basically detected an influenza outbreak in 25 countries, uh, actually two weeks ahead of the CDC. The CDC is basically the Center for Disease Control in the United States. And the influenza attack, uh, well, spread was basically in the Americas and parts of Europe. And Google actually did this by basically analyzing the, the patterns. And there was a peak in the Google search data because a lot of people were actually searching about their symptoms and why they were getting sick. And you can see those peaks in the graph uh, below right there, uh, how actually Google uh, detected this using the data science process. Now, another example uh, is our recommendation systems, which are basically used by a lot of service providers that I'm guessing you all have their applications on your mobile phone, like Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, and even Facebook. And uh, there are basically two ways that the recommendation work. And let's use Netflix as an example, where basically the first approach is that if two users, let's say, watch a movie of the same type, uh, watch movies of the same type, then these users are actually deemed similar. And the movie watched by one is actually recommended automatically to the other. And also, and you can see this on the right, if two movies are quite similar, then why not recommend a similar movie to the user as well? So this is another prominent example where we can exploit uh, insights from uh, user data uh, when watching or when viewing these services as well. Now, another ex similar example uh, and another data science area, which is also inherent to AI is object detection where uh, basically in this example, let's discuss uh, how do robots actually see. Now, robots use machine learning uh, by training a model where we basically give to the model uh, historic data. For example, let's say we give it a bunch of uh, pictures that have dogs in it, so that in the future, a uh, robot can actually, as it's moving around, can detect uh, objects that are similar to that trained data. So you can see the example on the on the right hand side uh, right here, where let's say a robot is focusing on on the dog right there, and you can see that at first it actually it actually sees the dog, but it starts out considering that it's actually a cat uh, because of its fur, I'm guessing, until it is actually matched at the end as a dog. So this is actually quite uh, internet to the data science process that we have seen uh, in, in our project. Now, uh, to summarize up, basically data science is, is the science of discovering what we do not know from our data. So basically we want to extract meaning from raw data and at the end gain insights and knowledge. Uh, we want to obtain descriptive, predictive, and actionable insights from our data. Descriptive meaning, for example, like pattern detection, which Google was doing. Predicting what users may like is what the recommendation systems do. And actually obtaining actionable insights is what robots do when they have to take a decision of what is the object in front of them. And uh, this allows us to also build confidence in our decisions for a lot of business. So basically, uh, do data-driven decisions. Now, it's also very important that when you're working with data that your end user also understands what the analysis has revealed. 
So in this case, it's really, really important to communicate uh, the insights that you have derived with very nice narratives that are understandable in layman's terms to the intended audience that you actually have. Okay, because if something is very difficult uh, to express and if there's a lot of statistics in these things, then uh, you're just gonna lose your audience at the end. And hopefully at the end, your analysis is worth it and you derive the knowledge that was not previously foreseen. So you're able to create actual products with that have major business impact uh with the insights that you have derived so what skills does a data scientist need well basically i like to summarize this up by mentioning that there's essentially three pillars which if you combine these together uh you're able to analyze data efficiently effectively and actually derive better decision making now effectively to do this you this is the area where computer uh, science shines where uh, data scientists have certain programming skills, understand how a database works and are able to extract data from that, manage uh, data that is uh, huge in size, just like the example in our project where we had more than 8 million songs, uh, and able to extract knowledge from that data. Now, there's another pillar uh, which has to do with the effectiveness of our approach, understanding what the data is telling us, uh, deriving uh, basically uh, meaning, meaningful statistics and inferring actually what the what the future is what the past is telling us about the future is relevant to statistics and finally there's the third pillar which we call substantive expertise or domain knowledge this has to do with the with the actual application so for example if we're working with financial data we care about the financial sector if we're working with sports data we care about the sports sector if we're working with uh, Spotify songs, we're actually interested in the music industry. So in this area, we care about, even if we have no knowledge about programming or even math, uh, the major thing right here is to ask very good questions. And after a certain member of our team derives uh, insights, it's to understand what is this, what are these numbers telling us? And if the analysis is actually revealing something meaningful or if it's just a random statistic, that was derived uh, from the data. And uh, how popular is data science right now? Well, and what are the needs uh, for future students that want to actually study data science? Well, uh, you can see here on the left that uh, data is exponentially growing, the amount of data that's been generated in the world right now. But the rate at which we actually have people capable of, uh, of processing all that data is not growing at the same rate. And you can see that there's a huge gap right there. So there's a shortage of data scientists, data analysts and engineers. And this was also identified uh, almost a year ago by Amazon as well, where they focused on the Middle East and uh, North Africa, which is essentially the area that we're in right here, where they estimated that by 2025, we need at least 10,000 data scientists in this region. And it's not just our area right here, but even the European Commission can confirm this, uh, these projections where they estimate that by 2025, we are going to need uh, more than one, we're going to have more than 1 million job openings for data related positions. So data scientists, data analysts, uh, engineering and these things as well. And let's not just focus even uh, on, on the globe or even in our area, but if we're talking about Cyprus, I did a quick search uh, on erbolodisi.com and uh, like uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there were more than 100, and there were actually 166 job openings for data related uh, jobs. So even now there's a huge gap, uh, even, in, even in Cyprus. And uh, IDC, which is one of the which is one of the largest uh, research and survey agencies in the world, they actually probed the industry, the ICT industry here in Cyprus, and they asked them, "What are they going to be looking for for future hirings in the next five, six, and even seven years?" And what we actually saw was that uh, even medium-sized companies or large companies, especially. What they're looking, what they're looking for, is people that are capable of uh, doing big data analysis, and uh, they're also looking for uh, data science as well. So these two combined actually make a very nice skill set to put on your CV 
uh, from now and even in uh, in the next uh, couple of years. And uh, this is why the founder of LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn is actually, for those who haven't heard of it, it's the largest online uh, professional network in the world right now. So the founder of LinkedIn is uh, referring to data scientists as uh, being a data scientist, like the sexiest job of the 21st century, meaning that it is actually very popular right now. And it is uh, data science skills are one and a half uh, skills right now in the ICT sector. So uh, here at the University of Nicosia, we're very, very proud to actually be launching in the fall the very first and only bachelor in data science here in Cyprus uh, by the computer science department. And uh, what's very nice about our bachelor is that it is just a four year bachelor program. It is taught in English. Uh, you students, future students gain experience in cutting edge technologies relevant to both processing data. And you've also seen some examples of the tools we're using here, but there's a lot more that have to do also with the uh, Internet of Things, with robotics and other relevant sectors. Students actually get the opportunity to work with real world projects. You've seen an example right here where we actually work with real data uh, and actual data from Spotify. And uh, students also have the opportunity, not in the future, but while they're studying, uh, we actually have dedicated course for industry placements. So students actually do an internship while they're uh, while they're studying, receive credit and actually get the experience of the industry while they're studying right here. And yes, you get the opportunity to be taught by 16 faculty members, which of course this number is just increasing. Uh, so uh, it's even getting better. And scholarships are available for the fall. Uh, I won't go into courses that we have. We're always updating our course portfolio to uh, to be relevant with the, with the technologies that are uh, very popular right now. And I'd also like to introduce also our master's in data science, which is, we're very proud of it because it's an industry driven uh, master degree, which you can finish in a year and a half uh, if, you, if you want to. Our master's degree is available online so you have the opportunity to uh, watch the lectures anytime you want. And you also get the opportunity to be taught by industry leaders. So we have data scientists uh, teaching in our program, which right now are, are uh, leading the data science departments in Barclay, in Expedia. We have uh, professors from Germany, from Switzerland, from Greece as well and by by having the online opportunity they are able to connect and teach you and supervise you as well and uh i just like to remind people that uh the university of nicosia is actually the only one in cyprus but also in the region that has a five-star rating a qs five-star rating uh in the area we are partnered with expedia uh, for this master, which will allow us to actually get uh, access to real data sets uh, for, and also to have uh, industry placements for our students, but also with the M competitions, uh, which are the leading forecasting competitions right now, uh, right now. And again, scholarships are available. Uh, so if you're interested in, in our master, uh, please, I have right here, uh, contact points for both programs, which uh, you guys can get in contact in, in touch with. I'm also very glad if there's any questions uh, to be asked to answer them. Otherwise, uh, thank you everyone for uh, watching our webinar. It was a great opportunity for us to present to you our project and also our programs. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. So, uh, bye from us, and we hope to talk again.